Hey everyone, it's me. And for this video, I'll be talking about image exposure, which covers a lot to do with how much light is let into the sensors. I will also explain how exposure could impact certain settings like ISO and aperture and all those things. So if you like this video, please subscribe for more stuff. So why it's exposure? So basically exposure in photography is the amount of light that reaches the camera sensor or film. So it can be, it is meant to be critical part of how bright or dark the picture appears. So images that are overexposed tend to be much brighter and they tend to be more washed out if you have ever seen an overexposed image before. And if while an underexposed image makes the image more darker and less light is you won't be able to see much of the details and stuff. You could, but it would be harder to see. And sometimes they can be done deliberately by editors and photographers for artistic purposes. Because sometimes some people do it for post-production. Just to make the image more aesthetically pleasing, depending on what kind of look they're going with. So, And these are the images that I was referring to. So the middle one is just in the middle. It's just right. And then the other two are not for the first one. Here. And this one as well. This is just to see. They just want to see how much of the images light and you have how much of it is dark and all that you will see a graph when you go into post-production depends on the software you can use adobe premiere pro or after effects or whatever you want to use to get a sense of the amount of light the image has and these two just pair up like overexposed, underexposed. I think this one's just right actually. And this one's just underexposed a little bit. So there are only two camera settings that could affect the luminous exposure, the shutter speed and the aperture. The third setting ISO also affects brightness of an image, but it doesn't have too much of an effect, which I'll discuss later. The process of changing exposure makes an image brighter by using editing software, such as Photoshop. So you don't really need to rely on the camera too much. You don't need to worry about the settings too much. If you're going to have that kind of image, you don't need to fix it if you don't want to, because you are if you intend on doing that, unless you intend to fix the image, that you don't want that image to be exposed. You have to sort it out during the production phase of the photography. But rather than saying that, you know, I could do it by through post. Photoshop can fix stuff. This is one called Adobe Lightroom, which could fix most of the problems. It's better than Photoshop, but you can use Photoshop on top of that Lightroom. So the topic of exposure should be easy to understand, but even the most advanced photographer could be confused and they can get confused really easily. So there are lots of settings, which is why people can get confused and things can vary depending on it could be depending on the make of the camera or some settings on cameras are different or 
It could be to do with each result changes on, I think that's why. So the camera, the camera's auto mode will set the brightness for you without you making adjustments, but it doesn't mean it's the correct exposure because even though auto mode is beneficial for helping people get the settings right or getting the type of setting they want, it doesn't mean that the camera settings right, you know, and it's not what you want. I think manual is more better because you will get you'll be able to have more control if you have if you put a manual setting in general that means you have more control of what you're doing and what's going on really and how you want your setting to be what type of exposure what type of focus you want as well it has to balance out so the photo looks good from the depth of field to the sharpness of it so so shutter speed has an effect on the exposure because it does constitute with the amount of light that goes into the camera sensor when the camera is taking the photo it could vary from one hundredth of a second or one tenth of a second or f f for, from three to five minutes. But some people take, use, build their own custom cameras that takes decades to capture a single photo. And the camera doesn't let you take decade long photos. So the longest allowable shutter speed is 30 seconds. Although this could depend on the make of the camera. Because some cameras vary, you know, because there are different brands and different models as well. There are two reasons why shutter speed matters when it comes to exposure. First of all, long shutter speeds lets in a large amount of light. If a normal if you're taking a normal day daytime photo with 30 seconds shutter speed, the image will be completely white. The opposite applies if you have a fast shutter speed, which lets in too little light. So taking a photo at night, that is 100, 1 in 8,000 8, seconds shutter speed will be completely black. Because sometimes it varies depending on how long you keep the shutter speed open in terms of letting in the light. How much time you let in the light because it can vary and if you leave it for too long it becomes dark or can become pitch black and you won't be able to see nothing. And if you let in too much light, it can you know make the image washed out and too much light is let in. The other reason how so the other reason is that motion blur affects images. So the long shutter speed captures anything that moves during the exposure. So if a person is walking into the photograph, they may appear to as a featureless streak across the image. So because they motion blur is basically when someone is moving in the photo. And if you have a long shutter speed, that will happen basically. Because they're moving in the photo and they kind of are creating that streak. You see lines, I think. If you see, you know what motion blur looks like. You will see a blurry figure of a person. But they're kind of blending themselves in the background. 
with the environment that the atmosphere that they're in because she didn't because they're not in that one specific position for long which is why they are in that way and it doesn't give the camera enough time to capture the photo sharply to gather itself and to allow itself to absorb the image and to sense the image as well so in comparison a quick shutter speed is much better than capturing freezing motion pictures so you're better off with a quick shutter speed if you're going to use motion blur effect be kind of don't really want the motion blur effect because it can make the image look blurry in that but if that's what you tend to do that's okay it's your ch ch choice it's your photo no one's telling you how you're supposed to take pictures and here you see what i'm saying so so image brightness can affect shutter speed or the exposure per se so a quick shutter speed as i just mentioned meaning that there is too little light to be let in which is why but it's more better because you can see a bit more detail but you have to make sure you do it right and longer shutter speeds can cause the image to look washed out and some things may disappear it happens in this image here that the light has disappeared and motion blur at different shutter speeds so one fifth of a second it just looks like a normal image while the difference between a six second shutter speed so the they left it open for too long so that means their image is a bit more blurry and it's here as well and you can see this is the setting for the shutter speed with the amount of light that's left that's what these this graph represents the, the line all the details that you can see in the image everything it has to be seen if you do for this overexpose one stop you will see that the graph changes like, quite consistently so the value of the numbers decrease while these go up the amount of exposure you put in so you won't be able to see much detail if you overdo the shutter speed so how aperture affects exposure so the larger the aperture the brighter the photo will be as more light is being let in through the lens is a bit similar to the shutter speed basically but it's nothing to do with that in that sense the shutter speed it is more about time the time enough the light being let in through the lens and while I think aperture is more or less to do with the lighting itself so it's just like when your pupils open and close because a certain amount of light is left so it is more important to assure that the aperture setting done properly for the photo to be at the correct exposure a large aperture the large aperture lets you have more light in the photo so more apertures like f stop 2 and f4 allows you to see the image in the dark i think with aperture you could do more things with it because it gives you it doesn't necessarily consist of time it consists with how bright the photo is and how much detail you can really see you actually can get away with the image being dark rather than shutter speed you can't really get away with that because 
it can mess. Once your lighting is too low, it's too low. A small aperture, which is f stop 16, lets in less light with a nearly closed aperture blades. So if a photo is taken of a Milky Way and the aperture setting, you will essentially get an image that is black. So the image is basically black. You won't be able to see nothing. So by changing aperture and shutter speed, you can capture exactly the amount of light you want, resulting in a photo with proper exposure. That's what makes aperture so powerful. So you have the chance to change how much aperture. The aperture settings one of the most important ones, I would say, because if your image is dark, you can't see nothing behind you. And if your image is too bright, you won't be able to see. I think you can't see the details without aperture. Just speak, you can probably get away with it, but I will still be on the safe side by putting on the right settings so you can see the photos more easily. On this, it's, it's an aesthetic thing. That's what shutter speed is used for. It's more of an aesthetic thing. An aperture, you have to use aperture if you're taking photos. You can't just leave without it. So how aperture change ex changes exposure. So it does affect how bright how much of an image has been exposed. Depending on how high you put the f-stops. And the very low of f-stop can make the image bigger. Is a big aperture meaning that more light is let in and the image becomes wash washed out and more paler. And a medium aperture means that the image is on the right in the middle so it's not too exposed and it's not too dark and the small aperture meaning the less light set through the lens meaning the image is kind of going dark but it's not completely black unless you set it to the max and it does vary by distance to like how much, how far the aperture, the image is from the camera, meaning how much light you can do from there, from a distance. If you do it from a small aperture, I think you will It will be difficult to see unless you make the lens more bigger if you do it from afar. That's what I would say. If you have an image that of a person that's far away, you won't be able to see much with a darker, a smaller aperture. You have to open it up. And if you can only do small apertures for close close ups or like mid shots medium close-up or extreme close-up whilst with a big aperture you do wide it's better with a wide and here's a graph here to explain how they all affect the exposure As I've been saying, that aperture is more to do with the amount of light you're supposed to put to let in. While shutter speed is more to do with the timing of light through the lens. And I haven't got to ISO yet, but I'll talk about that shortly. But first of all, this image here is one that's wrong obviously because it's too dark and they didn't they put in they made the aperture too small 
the lens is too small. And here it's very exposed. See the point, the sky is not even the right colour. And the leaves, parts of it look yellow here. And there's a white, the gate looks almost white. And so has here. And this one, you just can't see nothing. It's not you can't see anything, it's just either exposed. And this is the right one. And you can see how it varies. So ISO is not really part of exposure, even though it helps brighten photos. However, it does not affect the luminosity of exposure, meaning the amount of light cannot be determined through reaching the camera sensor. Hence, there is no impact. Instead, it merely brightens a photo in camera after your sensor has already been exposed to light. So, as I mentioned, ISO doesn't really have much of an impact on the photo itself and on the image. It's just more about the after effects. So it's used to raise, useful to raise your ISO when you have no other way to brighten your photo. For example, when you use a longer shutter speed, will add too much motion blur and you're already at your widest aperture. That's the best time to do it because the image has been exposed. I think the person has already overexposed it. They just don't have much choice. They're trying to get the best photo. And that's the only way they could do what putting in, use the ISO to get the right exposure. So it's a very valuable setting to have, but it's not always good news. So when you raise your ISO, your photos become brighter, but you will also emphasize grain, otherwise known as noise. You will see, we don't mean noise, as in like an actual noise, like making noise. Noise is basically certain type of grain you will see it. i'll show you shortly and discolored photo pixels in the image along the way because pixels can look discolored and it just looks hard to see and the quality isn't there so that's what i mean by it so comparing extremes so this here, this is ISO 100, which is basically the right exposure, the right ISO. And this one, the image certainly, that's the highest ISO. I think this image, there's something happening here. I think it's the quality here has started to change a bit and make the image more lighter. And when you get it, it becomes more harder to see. And ISO here, down here, you can see the noise. You can see a little bit of grain that is kind of causing the image to lose its quality. And ISO. You could edit it through post, post production. You could actually go on Photoshop or Lightroom or After Effects, whatever you use to make the image look more pleasing. A recommendation for most exposures. There's no universal tip for always setting the perfect exposure. 
Still, many beginners will have no clue where to start. If that's true in your case, you will want more than just general advice about shutter speed, aperture and ISO. If you want to a specific starting point that helps you put all this knowledge into practice more easily. For that reason, you'll find our recommended settings. Oh dear. Recommended settings for different genres of photography. So I think for photography it depends on the, the exposure depends on the genre really. Like if you're going for a horror, the, obviously the photo will be more dark. If you're going for a romantic comedy or so on some kind, the photo the exposure might be lighter. That brighter, you know. It depends. I think it really depends. On what the scene is and what is happening in that photo. Although they are very general settings, they should they should give you a good idea of where to begin if you simply want a few basic tips on capturing good exposure. Typical landscape photos not at night. So basically use a tripod. So tripods are good for stability of the camera because you need to take a good landscape. But you can do a handheld. Tripod's not always ideal, but you could. I'd rather do handheld, even though the camera, the image might be wonky. And switch to aperture priority mode where the camera automatically sets the shutter speed and you manually set the, select the aperture. Shoot at F8 in general, but use F11 or F16 instead of, instead if you need more depth of field, such as with a nearby foreground, or if you're using a teleport, a telephoto lens. This is on a full frame camera. Use your shut camera's equivalent aperture by dividing these numbers by your crop factor. Set the ISO to its base value. Let your shutter speed fall wherever it needs to be for the proper exposure. Watch your highlights. Don't expose any of them. If necessary, use the negative exposure compensation, compensation to darken the photo. Why? It is simply easier to brighten in post-processing than darkening overexposed highlights. see what happens these are two very good examples of images that have balanced exposures one of them this image kind of does look edited a bit as far as i'm aware this one looks fine so portrait photography without the flash so it's best to shoot handheld you you can shoot handheld, use a tripod or use a monopod, and you don't. There's no variation on that. In this case, the best option is not to set in stone. Use whatever method you're most comfortable with, or pick up a setup that works best for your particular photo shoot. It doesn't really matter what it is. You don't really need to worry too much on that. It's how you, as a photographer, it's the same with landscape photography, you just do what you feel most comfortable with. So same with the other one, is to use aperture priority mode. Choose an aperture that gives you pleasing depth of field. Typically something like 
f.8, f2.8 or f.14. But it depends on upon what look you want. So depends on the kind of look you're going for. Watch your shutter speed. If you start to notice motion blur, your shutter speed is too long and you need something quicker. So you have to change the settings for that. For the shutter speed. And keep your eyes so low. But don't be afraid to raise if your aperture and shutter speed are not letting in and lo- enough light. In darker environments, especially if you're likely if you you likely will need to raise your eyes so so that you can use a fast enough shutter speed. So you, if you're going for a darker environment, you're in a dark room or somewhere, you use the ISO to raise. Raise the ISO so you can let in more light, basically. Once again, don't overexpose any highlights. Because you need them. Use negative exposure compensation if necessary. Sports and wildlife photos. So shoot handheld or use a monopod. Because tripod, how are you going to capture all of that action? You ought to use a handheld because it's more easier you can use a drone as well a drone if you're using an aerial shot if you're shooting above on the air for example or in the sky that something you want to really see in the sky use that because you can use drone for photography as well i think you can do that now because i know you can do it for filmmaking because do the same for photography so use aperture priority mode because it's more ideal to do that. Or some guideline guides will suggest that you use shutter priority mode, which is good if you're trying to learn about learn things about motion blur. But it's it often throws your aperture to strange values and generally should be avoided once you get more advanced. It depends on the level you are as a photographer, if you want to go for that option. So use large aperture such as f2.8 f or f4. Watch your shutter speed very carefully. You will need something fast, like one five in one five hundredths or one thousandth of a second to freeze fast moving fast moving sports so most likely you will want to raise your ISO to a value that lets you use your use such as fast shutter speed it's worth to trade off Noise is better than motion blur, which it is. It doesn't matter if your photo is grainy, as long as it doesn't really make too much, you don't see too much noise in your photo, then that's fine. But motion blur can cause an image to look blurry and it doesn't look great, really. And don't overexpose any highlights because they're needed as I've been mentioning so that's it for this video sorry I'm so that's it for this video so if you these are the links that I've picked there are only two links but I've been relying on one website mostly so if you like this video, please share and subscribe 
and give it a thumbs up. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.